Welcome to Helping Organisations Thrive. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of James Kerr. Uh, welcome, James. Julian, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. No, it's brilliant to have you and already had our conversations before the start of this. It's wonderful. So I was going to introduce um, to the audience uh, a bit more about you, really. So you're a, a management consultant, you're a coach, uh, a keynote speaker, working to make a difference for businesses by helping leaders reshape the way that work is done. Uh, you've been the owner of your own consultancy company called Indispensable Consulting for the last 29 years. Um, you feature a lot of in business magazines, sort of Fast Company, Business Week and Bloomberg, uh, and you're a, a sort of economist in ink and management issues. So you're continually writing, continually to talk about leadership and business. Uh, and you've, you're just about to launch or have launched or pre-ordering and launching in January your sixth <laughs> book, um, uh, Indispensable, How to Build and Lead a Company Customers Can't Live Without, which I'm sure we will get to and talk about some of the insights that you're sharing in that. So um, a great accolade of expertise. Um, and I thank you for coming on the show and, and we'll share those experience with the audience. We're going to talk a little bit about how we can bring sort of resilience, resiliency to our organizations and to make them sustainable for the long term. But before we, we get into that, and I always ask my um, guests this is, uh, so James, what, what do you love about what you do? Well, you know, the biggest thing, uh, why I got into this racket, and as you point out, you know, nearly 30 years ago was I, I really wanted to uh, contribute to the betterment of uh, management thinking, leadership thinking. And that, that was my original sort of draw to getting into management consulting and thought leadership. Mm -hmm. And it's really um, sort of pulling on that thread that's kept me at it for as long as I've been at it. And like I say, I've written now six books. I've got hundreds of articles out there in different places. I'm writing quite a bit right now for CEO World. Uh, I, I'm, I've just sort of completed a series that I've written on decency, introducing decency back into uh, the C-suite. Uh, I think we've sort of lost our way lately, and not just because of COVID, but I think uh, even prior to that, that you know, it, it became very much uh, a greedy kind of uh, proposition in a lot of instances. And and I think uh, to the detriment of some businesses. Um, and I think decency needs to get, you know, placed sort of front and center again. And that's what I've kind of been writing about these days. But yeah, Indispensable, you know, I really, really like the book. I, it's one of my uh, my favorite books. Of course, you always like the one that comes next. Uh, so. I was going to say, it'd be, it'd be disappointing if you didn't like your book. <laughs> yeah, no, but, I, but I, what I really, why I like it is I think I finally have been able to craft the formula that can really help leaders, you know, build uh, and shape companies that customers can't live without so that those businesses become ones that, their customers prefer over any other offering in the marketplace. Hmm. And I think it took me 30 years to write this book. You know, it, it's a culmination of a lot of uh, great opportunities and experiences that I've had with clients over the years that sort of shaped the thinking that's that underpins the book. And to be able to have the opportunity to, um, you know, to have a publisher get behind it and say, yeah, this is, this is a good thing. Let's get it out into the marketplace is, is wonderful. And I think it's got a lot of great ideas that can help people, um, you know, drive business. And then that's, again, why I got in there into this thing, you know, in the first place. So kind of complete the circle, if you will. Yeah. So, 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 so building uh, upon that in terms of uh, that being uh, indispensable, um, we know that, I guess, We've always been in a competitive environment. Um, whatever business you're in, we're always competing for new business uh, and maintaining business with our clients and customers. Uh, and I think the last six months, in some sense, has probably got more competitive in terms of trying to win business because people are 
getting a lot more choosy about they want what they want what really matters do they really need your service anymore you know because of the real cost element going to it or they've just gone to a different direction and i guess what are the i guess strategies that you're employing or sharing within that book that would make people i suppose set themselves apart which is ultimately what you're doing you're setting yourself apart so that people then would only come to you for a particular service and maintain that business so it'd be great if you could share some of those uh, insights yeah you know becoming indispensable you know by definition means that a customer can't live without your service or product right and in order to get there, you've got to do a lot of things right, quote unquote, right. You know, I'm not inclined to do finger quotes, but if I were, I, I would put a finger quote around right. It doesn't mean that it has to be perfect. And I think striving for perfection is probably the wrong idea. But I think you want the right level of several things in order to to actually build a, a company that that is indispensable and the, and the things I identify in the book kind of what I consider my agenda for indispensability are things like having the right leadership, having the right vision, having the right culture, um, having the right people doing trust and empowerment in the right way. And then ultimately introducing the right change management framework that allows you to continue to evolve all of the above in a way that that's always uh, synchronized with with where where your business is now and where your customers need to be tomorrow, so that you're building products and services that they need next, um, and not just sort of staying status quo. I think that that's the formula, and I offer a bunch of different ideas in the book across those dimensions. And then I back it up with experiences, many of which are from my consulting practice, mm -hmm. but a lot uh, was added along the way um, to illustrate the points. And I, I've taken other great companies and and sort of um, demonstrated how they're applying these same practices mm -hmm. to build indispensable businesses. So, so that's kind of what the book's about, and that's sort of the formula, if you will, that's that's baked into that book. And of course, you got to keep it real. You know, at the end of this, at the, at the end of the day, as a leader in these organizations, regardless of your level, from the top all the way down to the supervisory level, um, you just got to keep it real. You've got to be authentic, and that's that sort of theme is is also consistently talked about throughout the book. That's good because you, you mentioned sort of formulas, and I know some people sort of find things all. Oh, James Kerr's got the you know the, the secret formula, the secret sauce, <laughs> and uh, and, and, I'm, and and it's not the case. And it, and it's good that you said that you know it's about being you know right but not perfect because obviously right. when we strive for perfection, we end up not doing anything because we're just wanting perfection, <laughs> and that's not helpful for anybody and stresses yeah. everybody else. But well, also right, being, being real as well because that's right. you know we work in a real world and and being authentic with that. And to be honest, I think customers, clients want reality they want honesty right. they want vulnerability don't they right so, yeah so just picking up on on that aspect of i suppose the leadership side of things one of the aspects you said what what sort of are you talking in terms of the type of leadership or the approach to leadership that would cause your company to be more indispensable um both but w with a heavy emphasis on how to lead um uh, I offer an awful lot of ideas about how to help people be their best. And, and for me, the leadership model is not about you. It's not about becoming a celebrity leader, <laughs> uh, though we have many in the world. Um, that brand of you stuff, I, I'm not exactly keen on thinking that that's the formula needed to create a big wonderful business i think it's rather being able to put your people first figuring out how to get the most out of them uh and and creating a path for their success that will ultimately deliver success to the indispensable business and and that's kind of what the leadership 
discussion in the book is is really centered on and i give you know practical advice you know there's a lot of you know bulleted lists and things like that 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 sort of uh help i hope help the reader get a better idea of what i'm talking about and and then i fortify it with examples from the marketplace okay and just want to share i mean one or two of those uh, strategies that you're you're sharing but also the, have you got some examples you've worked with companies on that Sure. I mean, a, a primary focus of my management consulting practice has been sort of uh, around creating the cultures that allow leaders to strive. You know, it's it's that that whole idea of thriving that um, that um, is absolutely an essential element of of building an indispensable business. It's it, it's being able to unleash all of the. Uh, uh, potential that, that that lies in each person in the company. So you know, a couple of the examples lately uh, that I've been working around is trying to tie the vision, which is again one of the elements of the formula, right, um, to behaviors, and and trying to help uh, link together the kinds of leadership behaviors that are necessary to achieve the organization's vision, hmm. and. The way that gets done is, you know, through a combination of not only, you know, uh, new policies and, and things like that, but it's actually sh trying to uh, focus on behavior. How do we act differently hmm. to achieve our vision? And a lot of times that manifests itself in the coaching side of my business. They'll, they'll clients will often ask me to help them develop high potential uh, people in their company, sort of the next generation of leaders. And a lot of times it's the senior most leaders need a sounding board and someone to talk with. Mm -hmm. And and that becomes a sort of a, a mechanism or, or, or an approach to uh, aligning leadership with vision and strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's helping people kind of make those changes. But the, I'll tell you, the biggest takeaway uh, in that experience as a consultant <laughs> for me has been and this is sort of one of those for what it's worth. You know, hopefully your listeners will appreciate the, the, the thing that I've kind of come to realize. But I can't change you, Julian. I can only change myself. And, and, and that's such an, an essential part of helping leaders become better is to, is to help them recognize it's on them. They've got to want to change, mm. you know. And I can give them all the frameworks in the world, but if they don't want to actually operate differently than they do, there's absolutely nothing a coach or a consultant is going to do to help change that. They've got to want to do it. And, and that's sort of, again, sort of a centerpiece of the way I approach coaching. Yeah, and it, I, I like that because obviously they, they say, I think the expression is, it, is it culture eats strategy for breakfast? <laughs> right. Yeah, that, yeah, I don't know who said that, sure. but it's it's a valid point because I think people mm. get caught up on you can be a strategist and you can be successful in that sense, but ultimately it's the culture which is driven by behaviours. Um, and as you say, if, if a vision is or values, however an organisation puts it, if there's in congruence to the behaviors people whether consciously or subconsciously it chimes with them doesn't it and then people just don't seem to it doesn't recognize and starts to create this um i'm not entirely sure this what the lead is saying because he's saying one thing doing another thing wants us to do this but he's not doing it uh, and i think the the whole piece on behaviors which ultimately is is role modeling and i think often people forget the power of role modeling and how impactful it's more impactful than in some sense, one-on-one -on -one coaching and training or whatever you want to call it. Um, and so it's really important to get that place of understanding that, as you say, if I change me, I can actually, by me being different, actually will have an impact on my teams and ultimately absolutely absolutely right. so yeah yeah and the alignment has to be there you know as you, as you reference you know i i can't say one thing and do another if i if i operate that way um people i'll lose followership people aren't going to follow me because they'll quickly realize i can't be trusted mm -hmm. if i'm saying one thing and operating differently um 
they're not going to model that. They're going to say, well, I guess he must not really mean it. And guess what they do? They'll model the bad behavior because because they watch your feet. I, and this is kind of what I coached you at the at the C-suite level. I kind of say, look, it doesn't matter what you say. It matters what you do because mm. your, your people are watching your feet. They're watching how you operate. Mm. They're watching your behavior. They're not listening to your words so much. They'll listen. Um, but if if those things aren't in sync, your your words aren't aren't uh, aligned with your actions, then they're not going to believe you. Yeah, and obviously we want we want behaviors that are obviously positive behaviors as well, not just alignment. Is it's alignment and making sure that they're yeah, going to well, have a positive impact as well. well. Right, and and that's kind of the finger quotes around the right leadership and the right vision and yes. all of that. So uh, right on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because you know I, I've been in organisations where we've had people would say it's they've got an effective leadership, as in they've mm. delivered on the KPIs, you know the profits and the sales, but the way they go about it, I would say, is the wrong way because it doesn't create a sustainable culture of people. Particularly if there's like a revolving door of people coming in and come and going because of the nature of the organisation, but. The leader would say they are effective, but it's being good as opposed to just being effective, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I think the goal um, sort of metric model thing is a way to kind of keep score, right? But your ultimate score is the client customer base. Mm. Do they prefer you over anybody else? And if the answer to that question is, no, they don't necessarily do, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and there's probably something inside your organization and the way you work across those dimensions I outlined earlier that is blocking you from being the preferred provider of choice in your marketplace. And you can still have a good business, you can still make money, you can still deliver value to stockholders and so on, but to be indispensable, that's the next level up. Yeah, and, and, and it's how, how do you take, you know, you may have good values, good company culture, great leadership, um, and doing all the things that you talk about. How do you, I guess, amplify or show that to a client or a, or a customer that they then they start to see that you are, or they are, you're indispensable to them in terms of their service you offer? It, it's their experience. Okay. You know, you, you can really only you can really only compete in my mind anyway, and this is kind of back to my strategy work that I do with with clients. I do a fair amount of strategy setting, and and I have a whole methodology around how to build a, a good aligned strategic plan. Um, but the biggest thing about that whole idea is I can only compete on product, price, and service. Those are the three dimensions that I can compete mm. on. And I need the right, quote unquote, combination of those things. Because I can't just have the greatest product if I have a lousy customer service. Mm -hmm. And I can't be the cheapest if I don't provide some level of decent product. You know, it's got to at least meet a minimum need, yeah. right? Even if I'm the least expensive provider. So there's a combination of those three things. I can hang my hat on how I want to compete. If I'm Walmart, I can hang my hat on, I want to compete with low price. If I'm Mercedes, I want to compete on great product, mm. you know? And if I'm Nordstrom's, I'm going to compete on great service. You may pay more for my uh, men's suit, but I'm going to give you an incredible service while you're buying that suit from me. You know, so so there's primary strategies that are are uh, in place, and I kind of gave you the sort of classic examples there. Mm. But but the idea is that I can only compete on those three things. So to be indispensable, I have to provide such an incredible experience for people in in all three of those dimensions, in order to actually be indispensable, considered indispensable, and. Here's another little known secret, and I'll whisper it because I, you know, it is a secret. But you don't get to say you're indispensable. 
Mm. Only your only your customer can say that, and they don't want to say it. they won't say it to you clearly. No, well, no. some might. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> I've got I, I've got some customers I think that feel that way, some clients that feel that way, but but I, you know, and I'm proud of, of that because that means I'm delivering on all fronts. You know, so taking that experience bit, obviously, you talked about the the product, you talked about the price, and you talked about service. How do you deliver an experience, whether it's using all those three in a, in a context that would make somebody go, first port of call on this service or product, I'm going to go to X company. Um, and regardless, that they might be a bit more expensive, whatever it is, but it's just the experience I have. How do you execute that, deliver that, I guess, in that context? Well, deliver is the word. Um you know, you've got to keep your promise, whatever that is. If you're going to promise, if I'm Walmart and I'm promising lower prices, then I better deliver lower prices. Now, of course, you know that there's all kinds of um, strategies within the strategy. You know, I might put the least expensive thing on the aisle. And once I get you walking down the aisle, I can actually in increase my pricing on similar products. Mm. And you may choose to buy something that's a little higher priced uh, but I got you to walk down the aisle you know so there's different ways to play the game in, inside the strategy mm. but but the end of the day it's how you deliver on that promise so it's creating sort of the brand promise and then keeping that promise if I'm a, a person that wants to drive a, a really good car then when I walk into a Mercedes or a BMW or Rolls Royce, you know, dealer, I'm going to expect a certain experience and you've got to deliver that. You've got to reach my expectations, probably exceed them. Not to sound like a consultant there, but, <laughs> but you've got to, uh, you got to keep your promises and, and deliver on those for, for sure. That's, that's the formula. And we know that experience ultimately is delivered through people. I mean, that's that's the interface. All right, absolutely. Yeah. So, how, so how do you get in your organization people in a place where they are delivering the experience that you have an expectation of that will make this company indispensable to that customer? Well, I, I think it starts with the vision. And what I mean by vision to be really clear, it's not the necessarily the values and that kind of thing, though I think those are all supportive uh, of creating the company culture that you want. Um, but they kind of reinforce the way we want to behave. But the vision is something different. It, it's being, in, and what I tend to do with, with my clients is I say, you know, I don't want a vision statement. I don't think you do either. And, and I do this little demonstration and I'll give them several vision statements right off of their competitors' websites. And I'll say, do you think this is your vision? And, and inevitably they all go, yeah, kind of, that's my, I go, right. They're all the same. You know, I want to be the best insurance provider on the planet. Okay, great. That does not does everybody else. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't distinguish you from any other insurance provider in the world. So what I tend to do is say, let's build a story. Let's make sure it's compelling and engaging. Let's mm -hmm. help your people see themselves being successful within that story. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about how we interact with customers, how we build products and services. Let's describe the tools we're going to give our people to actually keep the promise hmm. and I think when you start to tell a story and you bring it forward to your people and you socialize and institutionalize the vision then they know what good looks like because good hmm. looks like the story yeah and then I can start with all the other stuff engagement and empowerment and training and you know all of the rest but first I got them to I, I gotta get them to see where we're going and how they can be successful inside there if they want to help us get there. And that's a story. And that's again, why a story, because guess what? How do people learn? You you learn through storytelling. 
in any culture, any you know, way back in time, we told stories, whether we drew them on the cave wall mm. or we spoke them uh, and yeah. passed them down from generation to generation. Um, that's how we learn. So why should we think that a business should be any different? Let's tell our story. Yeah, that, uh, that is incredibly simple, uh, mm. but incredibly powerful. Because I think, as you say, vision statements become a, a thing on the wall. And I know they can provide energy. I know they can provide a sense of drive for strategies that can come out of it. Mm. I've done it myself. You use them as well. Um, sure. But actually taking that vision or the words or whatever it is and creating a vision, as in a story, uh, a narrative, however you want to call it, right? you say it's probably more powerful because, A, people will remember it because it, it, it's easy right. to remember sort of a, a picture of something or what you've seen visually or mentally mm -hmm visualized uh -huh. and then it, that narrative then becomes part of the people which then they can then start to play out what's their part in that story and how can they provide that experience i guess of you know wonderful service that makes us more indispensable than our competitors uh, i think that's that's quite powerful really um how, how do you i guess orchestrate that in an organization i mean you in terms of an, you got an example of how that's been done in a, in a way. Yeah, you know, I, I've got a whole chapter dedicated to that in the book. Uh, and I tell the story of a couple of different clients, their firsthand accounts of what we did to kind of not only build the story, but then socialize it because it's as important. And it's one thing to write the story. It's another thing to get people to read it. <laughs> um, to kind of uh, extend your thought f in, in the build up to the question, you know, things like the one line slogans that we hang up on the rafters of the building, you know, or inside our offices or whatever, those are all still good. Those are all still things we should do to reinforce, you know, mm -hmm. the message as you, as you said, but without the story, they lack context. So mm. we got to give them a story first and then pull out the pull quotes and hang those up all over the place. And mm. that reinforces the messages in the story. But as far as uh, firsthand, how, how I, I go about building these, I, I tend to start with executive interviewing and just kind of get a sense of what each of the members of the senior leadership team is thinking about in regard to where they'd like to see the business go. I, I then normalize that and start to craft a story kind of based on a, a, a template, if you will, that I use to to make sure I get uh, a comprehensive, more complete story. So I'm talking mm -hmm. about people and I'm talking about processes and technologies and customers and that kind of stuff. And then I, um, I go back in through workshop mode um, if allowed, or you know, if, if if we've got a commitment to really to really do it as well as we can, we'll we'll then solicit input from the rank and file and make sure that those basic ideas, uh, you know, resonate with them too, and they get to breathe into it. They get to provide additional input from those mm -hmm. basic themes, mm -hmm. so then that story becomes their story. Yeah, and then when it comes time to publish it, you publish it, and there's a variety of ways, like I say, to to socialize um, the story. I, and one of the more interesting ones, I was working with a, a um, insurance company in a specialty business. They, they provide specialized insurance. And they're in the Midwest United States. And, you know, there's a lot of cornfields and, and farm land out there. And they've got these incredible uh, aircraft hangars. So we actually held an event in an aircraft hangar and we brought all the people in the company to the aircraft hangar mm -hmm. and we created what amounted to a, a trade show. And we had a member of the executive team in each booth and we had the, uh, the broke the people up into groups and we rotated the groups through the, through the trade show. So they, by the end of their time, at the aircraft hangar, they've heard the complete story mm. from a half a dozen of their senior most leaders. And uh, they even collected little giveaway things in each, at each booth, you know, squeeze balls and yeah. golf, you know, golf tees and those kinds of things with the company slogan on them.
to reinforce that connection. And it also demonstrated, I think, leadership's commitment to the vision because you actually ask those leaders to give their part of the story six different times in that day to six different groups of people, you know, as they rotated through. So, Mm -hmm. so that's a commitment and it, and it's demonstrated through behavior because each leader had to actually give the story, give their part Mm -hmm. of the story. So again, just a quickie example of how you can then take your story and socialize it and make it real for people. I really like that. That's a way because by doing that, the, they're experiencing it themselves. Absolutely. Right. They are physically it becomes theirs. Right. Walking through and by doing it in such a, a novel way would then create that real memory and an emotional engagement, you know, all those wonderful psychological things that that would drive even more motivation. Right. Um, and it's the same way, oh, I've been to it like a gimmicky thing. Actually, no, this is quite powerful with some narrative going with it as well. Right. Leader sharing. And a shared experience, you know, because they get they get back to the to the to the office and they talk about it. Yes, and that's the important. <laughs> Every, everybody has to be part of it. It's not like right. the exclusive senior leadership team do this. It's it's everybody right. Right. That comes to it, and they all then go away chatting away this wonderful right. experience and story, and then suddenly that the feeling they're part of it. Then they're part of that story, aren't they? Right, and they had to move a little bit. You know, to rotate through those things that required people walking from place to place and collecting mm. things and putting it in a bag. And not that that's an incredible experience, but it's an experience. It's not just sitting there listening to a lecture on stage. Yeah, no, that's that's good, actually. And some of the companies you've been dealing with where have, have you said that they've had com- I've had customers said that they are indispensable, that they 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 put them in that bracket are they or they feel uh, like I, I i mean to varying levels you know the the like i said the the reason that i wrote this book was it's a culmination of 30 years of doing this kind of work with a lot of really great companies so it's it's sort of me putting a label on something that's the broad collective yeah. Um, but I, I but I'll definitely say that some of the clients that I've worked with over the, the years are really top of their industry and doing incredible things and and it's been fun to it's been a fun ride to be a consultant, you know, inside these companies. And how do we how do they maintain that? Because obviously we, we sometimes get to a, a plateau or a, a level or an expectation. And whether complacency slips in or arrogance, how do we maintain that sense of, I guess, you call it striving forward to keep that experience of this organization will still be indispensable? Yeah, I mean, the, the trick on this, and it, and, it, and it is a bit of a trick, you will have leadership shifts over time, people retire or gain other opportunities or go in a different direction and leave the company. And that can have a huge impact on the culture and, and on, you know, in the direction that that company goes. But you can maintain hope that all of those good things continue forward, even in the absence of key players and, and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, because you have enough buy-in commitment and belief in what you've been doing Mm. left behind so it's in the people that are left behind that have to keep that torch lit Mm. and uh the hope would be to institutionalize this way of doing business the way that leads to indispensability Mm. alive and well and independent of any given character as charismatic and loved as they may be uh we've got to create a a culture where the behaviors live on and and if you think about it that's culture 101 even from an anthropology point of view Mm -hmm. you know uh uh, whole societies operate with behaviors that certainly get better and adjust over time but there's still derivatives from from things that were handed down generation to generation Mm. 
Mm. And I guess you've got to keep that story alive, isn't it, and keep it going. Absolutely. And, and that yeah. story builds. And it's interesting, the whole yep. story side of things, where I guess it's where when entrepreneurs start a business, because they're very they're small and they, they often is launched out of a, a story and a and a passion and an and approach. Hence, they get that sort of the experience they give, but suddenly they get to a certain size. And it's, I guess, maintaining that storytelling even as you grow and scale up as a business isn't that too yeah absolutely i mean it, it happens um naturally anyway um because think of a new hire experience you're brought into a new organization and as a newly hired uh, staffer and immediately people start showing you and telling you how to operate <laughs> they're they're show they're showing you through their behavior. They may be telling you if they're a mentor or a trainer mm. or your boss will be telling you, you know, what to do and so on and how to do it. Um so it's baked into the culture and and the reality is if you can really institutionalize those behaviors that make your business indispensable, then that's the stuff that the people will be telling the new hire hmm. and that's what they'll be training them in. That's how they'll be leading them and guiding them and coaching them and, and all of that. So that's what we're trying to build. And the story, you know, I do it, as I said, very deliberately. I, I just think it's the most effective way to actually hmm. achieve strategic intent because yeah. the vision statement on the back of a business card, while that leaves you dry, uh, the intent the intent is still to try to achieve something strategically yeah. that's why we even print the other side of the card with a statement right yeah. so I'm saying why not take it make it a story make it compelling vivid as as, as vivid as you can and and really help people recognize how they can be part of something that's bigger than themselves yeah, no, that's important. And it's interesting because often people can't even remember their vision statements of the companies they work for. Right. However, if they were shared a story of the dream of, of this organization, what we're going to be like, how we're going to behave, what we're going to be doing in the future, that's very easy to articulate uh, and certainly with new hires. Um, I really appreciate your time today, uh, James. Uh, thank you for that insight. I really like that storytelling. I think that's quite a powerful uh, way of impacting people and organizations uh, and cultures. Um, so this book has let us know, I guess, when, where, and also how people can get in, in, in contact with you. Uh, that'd be great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. The book's available on Amazon already. It's there for pre-order. Uh, it uh, drops in January, I believe although my publisher keeps playing around with that date, but I believe, I believe it's late <laughs> January. Um, but you can order it now. And my website is indispensable-consulting.com. And there's some information about the book there as well and all of the services and things that we talked about today. Brilliant. Well, thank you for coming on. I appreciate uh, your time. Yeah, thanks, Julian. It was really fun. Appreciate it.